I actually discovered her in the kitchen where she was blue in her face because she was kind of having a seizure. Hello and welcome to Uncut, live from our studio in Dubai. The audio and visual podcast show that gives you exclusive scoop on our guests and hot topics including some of your favorite celebrities. And now, let the fun begin. Here's your host, S1. I can't even wait to start this show. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is for you. Wow, guys, today is going to be a very special episode. I'm super excited, Um, not just because I have a good friend of mine here, but because I have a very, very interesting person with us today. He is a business guru titled as one of the most influential young people in business by Fortune magazine and presented at the World Government Summit as an inspirational story of the UAE. Today, we have founder of sellanycar.com and social media influencer, Saigon Yalchin with us here. Yes, Woo! sir. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Uncut. Thank How are you? you bro? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. It's exciting. Um, we have so much to talk about. I hope you you spared us some time off your busy schedule. Of course. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> All right. Um, let us start with... Um, where your origins are from. You are uh, originally Turkish and German. Um, Where were you born and raised? So I was born in Germany with Turkish descent, as you said, and I was raised there as well. When I was approximately 19 years old, I actually moved out of Germany. Okay. Yes, but I didn't come to Dubai first. Where did you go first? You went I, to... I went to New York to learn English. Are you serious? And I still can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, your English is good. <laughs> Wait, so you went to New York and you... So basically, a lot of people don't know my history. Okay. Much, so maybe we can talk about it if we have yeah. some time. So basically, um, I wanted to become a professional football player. Wow. Yes. So actually, I was playing all my life. When I was four years old, I started. And then until I was approximately 19 years old. And then I said, okay, I have to make a choice. I either become one of the best football players in the world, right? All right. And if I'm in the top 500 best football players in the world, I might be a multimillionaire. Right. right? So I said, (laughs) nice. But if I was one of the 500 best entrepreneurs in the world, I would be multi-billionaire. Right. So I said, (laughs) statistically speaking, I should go with uh, studying something solid maybe. So that didn't mean I should become a business person. For me in my head, I just wanted to solve a larger problem I had, which I thought I need money for. And with with my 12 years of age, I thought doctors make a lot of money. (laughs) so my my that's a perception right that's a general (laughs) thing like we all think i wanted to make five thousand mark back then five thousand mark per month that was like super rich for me wow and then uh, so then i thought which doctors and uh, i said you know what aesthetic plastic surgeon (laughs) <laughs> you'll not believe I can't it imagine so I, I could be a plastic <laughs> surgeon <laughs> you know i did so much so basically wow. I, I worked at a hospital at a plastic surgery i applied i worked for free did you study it or no, no no before you just... you're allowed to study you actually have to do an internship in the hospital okay so i applied at a plastic surgery and i got accepted Oh right. my God. And I was the largest. So anyway, so I did that and I was so bad at it. Like I wasn't even a doctor. I was just an intern helping out in medical stuff, helping okay. helping the patients, giving them um, breakfast, coffee, tea, whatever. Okay. And then I got fired. <laughs> right, right, like, you like, like 10 <laughs> weeks later. Why did they fire you? She said, literally, the nurse said, you would be the worst doctor in the world, but probably one of the best businessmen. Oh. And I said, why? She said, because you, you're you not the doctor she sees in terms of, I couldn't see blood. I couldn't see like pus oh. out of, uh, coming out wounds. Like this wasn't yeah. me. I couldn't. And I was thinking this aesthetic plastic surgeons, they're usually like, 
the glamorous red carpet guys whatever yeah. that was my that was That's my just thing. one side of it right <laughs> that was probably no like none of it like yeah. literally it was really like it was like a carpenter they were really oh working on bones sawing them it was it was not me so anyway that didn't mean i love i didn't love people i loved yeah. people so i was always playing pay- playstation with the <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> with the patients whatever but i wasn't really <laughs> medical i was telling them stories <laughs> giving them business advices but not being a doctor right exactly so i decided you know what business so um and while i was doing that I always was, and I started at the age of 15, 16 approximately, I was a DJ. That's crazy. Yeah. I heard, yeah. yeah. And how? where did you start teaching? What, what? I was just playing football and at, at the side of the tournament, there was a guy who was DJing. Okay. And um, because it was the music for the football tournament. So I said, hey, what are you doing? He's like, I'm making the music or I'm playing the music. And I saw it and I was like, wow, that's really nice. Let me try Okay. And then I just uh, did that and learned and learned and learned. And when I moved to New York, I started, I mean, I wanted to learn English. That's why I went to school. Right. But I also wanted to play in the biggest events in New York. Right. But okay. I'm just a young guy who doesn't know anyone there. So I had to come up with a business idea, which makes it work. So that okay. was my first kind yeah. of business venture uh, beyond the f- freelancing part of DJing. Right? Okay. So I went there and I saw that there were 600 students at the language school, okay. which gave me an eight-year visa to the U.S. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like, okay, um, how do I make it work? So I went to the uh, event organizers and how do I get to them? So I collected 200 flyers of events all over New York. Anywhere oh I went, I collected God. the flyers and looked at the organizers' names and phone numbers. And I called all of them. That's actually kind of smart, right? Like, that's smart. That's because that's how I... Because you would find them, right, on flyers. Always what I do is, if I want to get into an industry and I want to actually master it, I want to know who the decision makers of these industries are. So, for example, or the authorities, when I wanted to become an aesthetic plastic surgeon, where did I go? I went to the library and asked the librarian, give me... The uh, the books written by German aesthetic plastic surgeons. I looked at all the names and I called them up, oh. and I said, "Hey, I, I don't. I'm not a patient, but I'm a guy who wants to decide about his life. Uh, can you help me with two questions? One, um, are you rich? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's straightforward. Are and, you rich? <laughs> and two is like, is your life glamorous and whatever? Is this the real image? of uh, is this the re- is the image i have right. the reality and they totally told me they are not uh, rich in terms of billionaires yeah. and they are also not kind of having this glamorous life a young kid like me was thinking so right. i ignored it i still did it and failed so that was the first learning for me do i really love the job or do i really love the role and you have to love the job not only the role people right. see yeah right Anyway, so I went and collected all these flyers and then I knew who these decision makers were. So I called them up. I said, hi, can I be your DJ for your events? Right. And the questions I always was getting uh, through my empirical research pretty much was yeah. how many people can you draw right. to the events? <laughs> so I felt like, okay. These guys, these are organizers yeah. that want to know how many people you're going to bring. Uh, when I told them I just moved to New York, they knew it's not going to really work. So I said, I can bring 25 people. <laughs> <laughs> Are you yeah, serious? And, uh, so I just said it. And then they said, okay, then you can play in the small room. And by the way, if you buy the tickets, um, then I'll give you um, 15% discount. Okay. Sorry, uh, 20% discount in the first one. So if I you said, bought the tickets yes, yourself yes, and then sold them. Yes. Okay. So I said, okay, what if I brought five, 50 people? They said, okay, then you get... 20% discount. Okay. So it was 15, 20. And then I said, what if I bring 100 people? They said, okay, we'll give you 30% discount and you can play in the main hall because they couldn't really believe. Yeah. I said, all right, fine. So I went back to the school and I said, hey, do you have any event coordinator here for these students who don't know where to <laughs> yeah. go? And they said, no, we don't have an event coordinator. I said, 
I can do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I took all, but I was basically the go-to guy for the students who didn't know English right. and didn't know New York. And I said, hey, I know New York. I know all the organizers of events. Anything you want to do. I was like a tour guide. So I said, by the way, you get 15% discount oh. if you go through me. So what I did is I got 30% discount, but I only gave 15% uh, to the to students. The student. So the rest was my profit. Right. First week, 123 people came with me. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And then uh, that's how I kind of financed my my school a little bit. And then I moved back to Germany. And that's crazy. There's more happening. But <laughs> I don't want <laughs> to talk too much. That is really crazy. So, Saigon was a DJ. And what was your DJ name? Yeah, something like this. Saigon. Sai G. Sai G. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that works, I guess. That's the same, right? Um, <laughs> what was your first job? Like, would it be that one that in Germany? Or was it like, what was your first job where you were actually hired? No, like, actually, uh, my first job was I was, uh, when I was, I think, 14. I was distributing uh, catalogs of supermarkets. Okay, like um, two doors? Two or? Door to door, yeah. Nice. Uh, it was nice. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> that I mean, was like... <laughs> my first month's salary was, like, if you now convert it, it's around $70. That's crazy. But it's a good first job as a kid. I mean, yeah, come exactly. on, you were 14 years old. And then I had another one, which was uh, counting inventory at a larger supermarket chain. And you had to, I had to count, I remember, I had to count uh, candles. Candle. I think it was like 10 million candles. It felt like. No way. <laughs> it was a, so it didn't stop. I had to count them because companies have to do that to kind of um, double or to verify the count of inventory they have. Right. They chose me. You know what? The induction was so funny. They asked me if I can count. I said, of course I can count. And they said, count these. <laughs> So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They said, okay, you're good. No. <laughs> that was the interview. That oh, was my God. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, let's just make sure this just guy doesn't case. have any <laughs> any mathematical issues. Just in case. <laughs> one, two. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, so was it by choice or was it something that you, you like needed it? Was it? just for your pocket change or i mean i always did that i also did a flea market on the street i just sat on the street and sold my you know these surprise eggs oh yeah when you open like them the with your, surprise exactly yeah. you open them and then they, i sold them on the street that was my first i think that was even before i did the news those paper. markets are common in germany right like it wasn't a, i made it i just sat on the side of the street oh, it wasn't street. like a market no no it oh. was just me and my two <laughs> my two best friends so it's like a lemonade stand but you yes. made it like a kinder chocolate yeah. stand i made 10 marks i think yeah per day that was good that was 10 good mar 10 marks that was that's like times two right but the or point is i didn't understand business that much when i was 12 because that was even before i did the new, uh, catalog thing right revenue for me was profit that was the same thing yeah. so if i sold for 10 marks and your that cost was, was my yeah. my cost was zero because because yeah. my parents bought the kinder yeah, thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i had zero cost of goods sold that's amazing <laughs> saigon um when did you move when did you first move to dubai because you were in New York, and yeah. then you... Did I, you moved, move? I moved back to Germany. Okay. Then I started my studies as a, at the business school. Um, and then I actually moved to Mexico. Mexico? Yes, I moved to Mexico. Why? I, what, like, I studied there as well. Not that there's anything wrong with Mexico, but how, how did that happen? Because I wanted to learn Spanish, and I studied in Spanish. Are you serious? Yes, yes. So I did an MBA program in, in Mexico and then actually moved to South Carolina in the US. Oh, wow. And I studied MBA there as well. And then I moved back to Germany. I graduated in Germany. Then I started another company in Germany. While I was DJing at German TV, the show was called uh, German Idol. Or, yeah. Or, it's, or like, X it's, Factor. Like the, it's like the American Idol. or like, Yes. Yeah. That was what I was doing on the weekends. During the week, I was studying. Well, and yeah, I mean, I'm fast forwarding. So, and then I kind of started another company and then I moved to Dubai. So, how long ago was that? When did you move to Dubai? 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Yes. So, I'm still young. 
<laughs> All right. <Don't> <laughs> <laughs> we will not come to that part yet. <laughs> That's the thing. Like when I was reading through your stuff, I looked and I was like, wait a minute. How old is this guy? It, it sounds like he's, oh, you're talking about a 70 year old, but you've achieved so much um, from a young age, which is very inspirational. And um, that's what we're heading to. Um, there's another story that was very inspirational, which was um, you often talk about how you came to Dubai with a backpack. You only came with a backpack? Yes. That's it. I mean, what else do I need? You didn't have a suitcase? No. What I needed... Look, the story was this. When I was in Germany, I started the company with uh, borrowed money from two friends. Okay. No, it, was not, it wasn't a lot of money. It was a fashion brand. All right. It was uh, handbags for women and diamond rings for women. Okay. But low cost. So basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to say designed in Italy, which they were. Right. You want me to talk about more? So basically, <laughs> so I thought, okay, there's a very successful business model, which was uh, the shopping clubs. They were called private shopping clubs. Like okay. in the US was called Guild and in Germany, there were some everywhere. Right. But they weren't here in the Middle East. And what they were doing was they were getting branded items at a huge discount, up to 90% discount. Okay. All right. Well, that was like past season stock, but also they became so big that they actually became trendsetters and brands, which were not really known, suddenly sold really well. So right. I said, why don't we create a brand which was uh, from the cost structure exactly optimized for these shopping clubs? So I said, okay, we're going to have branded handbags and I'm going to look at the best sellers. I'm going to have them designed in Italy. So I went to the factory of a very famous brand, but... I said, before I can place a huge order, I want you to design 10 bags for me. And they said, well, that's going to be expensive. I said, okay, for that one sample, I can pay more money than I can sell it for. But then I would have an extremely nice sample. And I did 10 of right. them. So what I then did is, I, okay, which country is the best in designing and creating? I thought it was Italy, maybe France. So I went to Italy. But which country is the best in copying? So okay. I said, maybe I should go to China. So I went to China. I okay. said, hey, I have this bag. Can you copy it? And it was actually my own uh, design, design, which right. I copied myself. Why did I make it, make them copy it? Because it they were so good in making this bag cheaper. Right. But was cost exact, exactly the same, uh, same design. It needed like two, three iterations. But then they became so good. I said, wow, now you created a bag, which is designed in Italy, but it's so cheap compared to Italian prices. Right. So then I was able to sell those on these shopping clubs at the right price. So, and it sold out, all of them. Wow. And I sold 1,200 bags in 18 hours. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So anyway, um, but that was it. I didn't have a lot of money. I okay. didn't make a lot of money. I mean, it was okay, but I had to give it back to the investors pretty right. much. And But it was a huge learning for me. What I then did is I said, okay, this, the brand is nice, but the shopping club, they just sold so many bags. How do they do this? This is a great business model. So I said, I'm going to create one in the Middle East. So okay. I looked at uh, the internet penetration rates. I looked at... Why the Middle East? Like, how did that come because to Because I did, I actually looked at all the internet usage, uh, broadband usage uh, in the world, and I looked at where didn't they have uh, shopping clubs, this business model, online fashion, okay. at a discount. And the Middle East was like a was just a gap i said why isn't there anyone doing this so i looked at the numbers i said maybe there are not enough people online but when i looked at the past 10 years of internet penetration it grew by nine thousand percent so people were actually already online so there was an audience right. but the but the supply was, was no. the supply was missing so i said i'm gonna do this so i went there i didn't have a lot of money i had a credit card though okay and i moved actually uh, i went here first i think in April, May, or September 2009 to uh, to basically get to know some people. I just stayed here for a week. And then I came back to Dubai um, in January 4th, 2010. Now, the issue was this. I relied on my credit card. Okay. And which uh, basically in German credit cards stopped working 
first January 2010. Why? Because there was some digit issue from 2009 to 2010. 20 million credit cards in Germany stopped working and they got replaced. But I was on the fourth, I was here, so I you missed that. And I didn't even get the news because I was here. So okay. I went to the machines and they stopped working. I said, why is this not working, my credit card? And I was in the middle of uh, fundraising. So, you know, I didn't have an office. I stayed at, uh, I didn't stay. I actually uh, went to a restaurant in Barsha. Okay. That's what I used as an office. It had free Wi-Fi and I ordered the right. salad and a Coke the whole day. And that's it. Yeah, I could use that. it as an office. So I used that one to build the business plan, to talk to investors, to hire potential team members. Right. So I was doing that. While I was doing this, my credit card stopped working. So, And I was negotiating with the investors. I didn't have the money. So I said, can someone please give me money to survive? <laughs> and um, How did that go? I actually borrowed, uh, I remember that, I think 1,500 dirhams. That's like what, $350, $400 yeah. from the receptionist of my investor. Oh, wow. And then I remember she came back like, how many years later? I think that was like four, what was that? Like many years, five, six years later, she came to my apartment in the Burj Khalifa and she said, you remember when I borrowed you 1,500 dirhams? I said, yeah, I gave it back, right? She said, yeah, but times change now, right? <laughs> <laughs> but now you're in Burj Khalifa. <laughs> yeah, so basically it, w- it was when I had to sign uh, shell agreements for a sale, right? It was a big deal. So anyway, right. <laughs> it was so it was just how times changed. So anyway, I moved here and that's where I started. I didn't have a visa, obviously, because you need a company to get a visa. In order to get a company, you need right, a license. Right, of course. And that's a long story, yeah. That's crazy. Uh, did you feel like it was um, it was tough starting up a business here, or wh- like being you know in the situation you were at? I think when there is a challenge, there's an opportunity. Because at the beginning, when we started, um, it wasn't really the legislation wasn't really advanced in terms of e-commerce, right? So right. Uh, do you need, I mean, this is a bit detailed, but do you need a free zone license? Do you need a mainland license? Do you need both licenses? How do you get those licenses? It was a bit tricky. And we worked a lot with the government. They have actually advanced so much. Nowadays, right. you see there's so many more free zones. There is uh, so many more um, uh, license types which we can use. Also, when you build e-commerce in the region, you don't only build that business. We had to build an infrastructure around it. Like, Fine, you have the products, but how do you ship them, right? right? So you need a logistics company which helps you. How do you get paid? You can't only do cash on delivery. You also pretty much for your working capital situation, you actually have to accept credit cards. But which payment gateway is actually working here, right? So it was yeah, a bit tough. a lot of like And we've detailed. actually, in the, in the group, we've actually built those businesses around the core business as well, which was, um, I think, the... It was good for new entrepreneurs, so we kind of paved the way for them. Yeah, but it was challenging in the beginning. Did you encounter any uh, like failures with that? Was uh, anything with that in particular, or would you say that went pretty smooth, and then you hit like block roads or anything later on? Uh, I don't think anything moved smoothly, so it was. And a still doesn't. There's always uh, failures. Like, for example, when we launched Sokka.com, which was the uh, online right. fashion uh, store, uh, we had 25 employees approximately. Okay. And a month later, I figured out that there was fraud in the team. So we fired all of them. So I was alone, pretty much. You fired all of them? Yeah. And we had to... It was we a had teamwork. To, yeah, and we had to actually rehire everything. And I was 24, 25 years old, so it wasn't really uh, a right. pleasant experience. I wasn't a really good CEO because I was still learning. But at the same time, it was a huge uh, challenge for me to not give up. I could have just given up, but it was really, really tough to, to ca- first of all, lose faith in, uh, in or trust, right? which I, I never wanted to do, and I still don't. I always believe in the good of, of uh, in people. Right, I, and I, I give them this trust advance. I didn't want to lose it, but it was a real big challenge to actually not lose that at that point of time. 
while the company was growing in the yeah. seventh month i remember seventh month after launch we made a million dollars a month that's crazy so uh, so for you it was like that was so yeah and then we you know the rest is history sucker uh became really history like you sold sucker.com to souk.com yes so basically it was uh we merged it so it became the souk.com group okay so souk.com back then was uh pretty much just moving away from the ebay model to the amazon model it was auctions then removed auctions but it was pretty much digital in the media city right. while sukkar was retail and, and warehousing and logistics so putting that together was great because Suk had a huge brand and uh, also uh, a massive uh, traffic while Sokar had a bit of retail and logistics experience and warehousing experience when we combined that actually was great so and um, by that time we already had i think combined over 600 team members 600 and then it, i think at the end it was almost 4000 so 4000 that's what it reached towards the end yes but that one it was international it was the whole soup.com group I, I actually resigned as an active uh, manager in 2013 already. I remained as a uh, part owner, but I actually resigned because I started sellanycar.com. Right. And you um, you were still a shareholder though, right? Of Sook.com? No, it was sold 100% oh, to, it was to Amazon. Yeah. yeah. And then they sold to Amazon. I mean, that's crazy how the cycle is would you have ever thought that that would happen when you started Sukkar? no <laughs> i was happy that we started it so but if you go to sukkar.com now it actually goes to amazon so it's it's a good feeling to go that to is, the right. largest tech company in the world <laughs> that's crazy um sell any car.com you started that when you were when you just resigned from uh, Souk? Yes. And how did you come up with that? Tried selling my car and it was a hassle. I figured, uh, why is it so complicated to sell a car, a used car? And there should be better ways of doing it. Fast, easy, and at a fair price. So then you... Then I basically... I, I lose classifieds, which are kind of horrible experiences. So you have like strangers coming to your house, you give out your phone numbers you right. tell them where you live they don't show up they just waste your time and uh, it costs money to list and all these things it didn't make sense i said if i'm selling my car why should it be, be a, so six, a six weeks experience it should be a 30 minutes experience that's what i put in the i said any car that's why it's in the name should be able should be sold in 30 minutes and that's our yeah, that's a, that's a marketing um, uh, message yeah. message that you convey because everywhere you see, I mean, you have crazy billboards here in Dubai, hmm. big ones, and it says sell your car for cash or anything in 30 minutes, right? Cash or bank transfer, not anything. <laughs> <laughs> we will not do more. <laughs> <laughs> you had to take it there, didn't you? <laughs> um, what is something uh, you also... You just came back from your tour. You were in Germany. Yes. And you are touring around right now and giving motivational so coaching, would you call it? Coaching or would speeches? It's basically or? a bit of... So it's split into uh, seven parts. Okay. So it's a bit of my story and mindset. But then it pretty much is all about business. So it goes from idea valuation generation to business planning team financing business intelligence okay and uh, these are the things we talk about so people actually who go there they actually learn something okay. i don't just want them to say hey, okay what did you do i want them to know that these are the tools and frameworks i have used okay and i'm still using and i didn't do a full tour i call it the tour because it's still going on i did one show in frankfurt and the next one is going to be announced soon okay and it sold out so i was happy I saw that. I saw some footage of that online, which um, people can look up. And it was crazy. Uh, people were there, emotional. Uh, they were very connected because you're also, as we mentioned earlier, you're also a social media influencer. So people do follow your life on social yes. media as well. 
That's true. I mean, at, I mean, you wouldn't believe, but three years ago, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a Facebook page I was using or what. I didn't even have WhatsApp or Instagram, nothing. Are you serious? Yeah, I was just totally off the grid. And then I figured, why do I keep everything for myself? It's a bit, uh, I would say, selfish. Right. Or well, I didn't really want to hide behind the logos of my companies. I said, companies, especially startups, they have one issue, and that's the trust issue, right? When it's a new company, you don't know that company. So I right. said, if you have a face and say, look, I am out here and I represent these companies and people can trust me, then I will have my own voice. But I will also create a, a trust relationship with the audience, which is something which helps the businesses. Right. And at the same time, we can give back something to society. And what what do you say to those who say, like, you know, it's not good to show your face of a major company or like that? I mean, there, a lot of the major companies have faces obviously we know who they are but they're not out there as much as you are because um for you you also promote your businesses on your social media etc right and what do you what do you say to that so i think it's uh, it depends on the generation like look at the iconic ceos we had before for example steve jobs which was out right. there we have today we have elon musk we have richard branson these company CEOs pretty much are, uh, while well, Richard Branson is not a CEO anymore, but he's still representing the Virgin Group. I believe it creates trust for their brands. And they have done it with traditional media, pretty much. They, they used uh, the, the new TVs and, and all these things. Yeah. Well, I believe that's PR 1.0. I believe PR 2.0 is, it has social to involve media. social media. And this is, I think, more like my or younger generations which uh, ha have to embrace it. Um, who's the CEO of Ford? Of Ford? No Ford. Clue. The company for car or General Motors. Uh, no clue. Yeah. Why? Because it's such a huge company because that's a different generation. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's right. different. It's, we should know who the people are. And there's we, pros and, and cons will, to everything. You right? will... It's the con is it's very it's very uh, if you don't know what you're doing or you basically just are irresponsible online and say whatever is on your mind or you don't you don't you forget that there might be children watching, then you right. should pretty much not do it. But at the same time, uh, when you are out there with your face and your name representing a company, you will be more responsible and you will not do anything which actually harms your customers because right. you know I could. If I was hiding behind my logo, I could just resign and the new CEO takes over. I have no yeah. I have no damages. But if I was out there with my face and name, it will haunt me. So that's yeah. why I have to be careful. And I want to be careful. And I actually want to stand with my name. And that's probably pretty much more difficult. Yeah. But I don't I, I don't want to be hiding behind it. I agree. That's um it's a smart theory and I, at the end of the day i feel like also it gives you more credibility like I, I i i when i see a company with someone behind it i say okay i see you know even even if it's just real estate agencies and they put the uh, uh re realtor on the his picture and his name and stuff i feel like okay i see these people now i know i put a face to the company yes uh to whoever is gonna sell me something you know so it just makes you feel better of um, course as a consumer so it has it has this business aspect obviously but it also is um when i learned something in the past decade i learned so much about business and i'm still am why not share it with others when did you start your youtube channel how did uh, that come about almost three years ago almost three years, three years ago. ago mind you um for those who are listening Sagan is runs companies that are estimated billion dollar net worth uh or worth um and has his social media which he's active on We're talking about instagram and uh also a youtube channel yes which you create content for yes regularly yes look there is a great team behind me. It's not like yeah. me sitting there doing everything. I have to give credit to the people who actually create content with me. Right. Why I do that? I mean, I said uh, the uh, reasoning behind it. But when I started, the first point was I, met a, I saw a video on YouTube. And it was Mo Vlogs, this video. He was, sold okay. a car to us. 
Okay. So I said, oh, wow. And uh, that got like a million views or something. I said, whoa, we spent on marketing uh, so much money, but this guy just posts a video and he has a lot of uh, reach. Yeah. So I said, okay, uh, I want to meet this guy. So I reached out to the team. They actually got in touch and I invited them to my house. And the rest is history. I figured that's that's really nice. Like this guy, he was, I think, 21 years old maybe back then. Okay. I said, you have so much reach and you have trust with your audience. This is what my company should have. This so much reach and so much trust. I I really admired that. So, and I saw his uh, business acumen and I also saw his hard work behind it. And then one thing I w- I really realized. I said, hey, when we we did a video like a few weeks later or a month later, I don't remember. And it was a it was a giveaway. I okay. think we invited someone from his fans to visit Dubai at our cost. Okay. Or at my cost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, hey. If you want to be part of it, comment down below. So I wasn't really experienced in social media. So I said, okay, so we read and we choose. And then overnight, it had 120,000 comments. And you and I realized, what is, <laughs> you can win elections with this power, right? <laughs> because you go, oh, so that's, that's crazy. And yeah. So I was, I was like, okay, social media is, is that's it's power. It. That's yeah. it. I have to be on it. Fame is one thing, right? Fame is a different kind of power. And then money is a different kind of power. How would you compare the two? Because you, at this point, I probably think have both. Both of them come with responsibility, right? It's just, right. you know, what does fame mean? I think fame is just a combination of being liked and being known, right? And right. the result is being famous. Right. Um, now, what I really... Um, I didn't want to be known just because for the sake of being known and take people taking pictures with me. That wasn't really the attractive right. part. It's more like, as I said, creating trust with the audience. And uh, you can use fame to make money, but that wasn't also my thing. I basically have other... Yeah, you had. I don't think YouTube <laughs> makes me yeah. So, But having said that, YouTube I think... YouTube pays for the sugar at home, right? <laughs> 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 maybe for the sugar <laughs> no i don't think so and both of them I, that's what i could leave with uh, i think with you guys it's just if you have both right make sure that it comes with responsibility your first video was startup hero yeah that's basically was um my concept first i said um let's invite people to dubai or actually have people from Dubai who have business ideas and I give them my feedback. I invite my friends and uh, potential investors, co-investors, who would also give feedback on ideas the audience has. And now it's the largest entrepreneurship community in the world. You had taken a small break, but um, off the YouTube aspect, I know that the actual site is still going on. Yes, of course. Um, but... Are you coming back on the on so YouTube startup hero? That? Startup hero is not only the episodes you see online. There's a lot of uh, applications. Over, I think we have almost sixty thousand applications of That's business plan. So you have to go through them, read them, answer these people one by one. And we don't make a show out of every single application, right? right. Sometimes we do shows, and we did I think four already. We did one on uh, German TV. We did three on YouTube. Um, we also are planning to do this uh, as part of the next uh, tour. So basically, oh, okay. the next stop will actually have a session for Startup Hero as well. Now, you started a new business also recently. Um, Which one? <laughs> yeah. Which one? Happy Box. Well, I actually invested into it. Uh, I'm not the CEO, but obviously, who comes to S1 without coming, bringing gifts? Oh, right? my God. Look, guys. Oh uh, my God! Isn't, isn't it? <laughs> we so got the call strawberry. the whole team. Call the whole uh, team. Call <laughs> the whole team, right? So that is crazy. Look, wait, that looks so good. Is this fresh? Like of course. this I looks mean, fake. It's not. Fake. <laughs> it, it's not fake, but please, try one. Have this, one. This is so good. This is good. Of course. I never tried this. What is this? Strawberry flavor. Strawberry with strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> you heard oh. how it, it's crunchy. <laughs> it's so juicy. Mm. Mm. this is really good so for those of you listening we are having <laughs> strawberries uh, 
um, that are dipped in strawberry milk chocolate. Or I know it sounds disgusting. <laughs> if you don't see, just hear. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, it does, honestly. Can I see that box? Please. So, it's not happy the- box is um is new, right? Yes. Check this out, guys. Beautiful. Um, so you just invested into this? Yes. Was this one of the ideas that came to you through? Yes. Um, no, that's also not a good learning. So when you start a business, you usually. Uh, don't go with version A, right? So you always start with something, you have assumptions, and then when you hit the market, you feel like the customers are looking for something else. This is actually the third version of the company I invested into. First one was completely different. Then I said, hey, why don't you switch it to fruits and whatever, and uh, I'll invest more. We did that. And now we actually switch it to a marketplace, which is even better. So basically we are partnering up with all bakeries and all... um, that's guys incredible. who can produce these things so we are everywhere i see that you promoting this on social media a lot as well sometimes how much does social media really impact the business because you know there's a huge debate on conversion rates and you know um how does it really i mean guys i'm still eating the chocolate in the background <laughs> don't mind me this is so good these strawberries <laughs> are amazing i think one of the reasons for i, I would say a nice very very nice side effect of my tour was that to show that you can sell stuff on social media as well in this case was tickets to my show right okay so if you debate conversion rates then i think it was a great one because it sold out without doing any external marketing i only put it on on my stories and it sold so while I'm not using social media for sales as a primary goal, right? I think it really helps to again create trust because would you eat Happy Box if you wouldn't trust it? Probably not, right? Right. How do you get trust? Invest a lot of marketing, or you don't invest a lot of marketing and use social media, or you use both combined. But as a startup, by definition, or I would say in most cases, you have limits and budget. Was it easy growing on social media for you? How how was the path of that? Because you know, for you, you've achieved obviously a certain number, so now it's more impactful. But when we're talking about the start, was there a lot of investment that went into it? It was. Um, I mean, I wouldn't call it direct investment, but I invested time into right. it, and I owe a lot to my friends like Mo Vlogs, which basically uh, promoted, uh, promoted and featured me on his channel a lot. Okay. And over time, I've met other friends and we became real friends. So at the end of the day, I think this really helped. Of and course. But then I think nowadays it's more like people know what I'm standing for and they follow me for who I am, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, I'm sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I have um, something I want to talk about. I know you don't talk about this topic in general, um, but... I want to just, you know, see what I can get out of you. (laughs) And I'm just doing my job, all right? Obviously, you earn a lot of money. That's no secret. Uh, But you are extremely giving. And I know that because we're close. But in general, people don't know that. Because a lot of people online have this perception of, oh, he's he's so rich, he's famous, he's living the life. But what is he doing for the community? Now, there's two types of people. There's the people that film themselves <laughs> doing charity work. And then there's people that don't talk about it. And Saigon is one of those people that don't talk about it. So um, I wanted to just, you know, bring this out to the public and see you have stuff from a website that you just started, I think, also recently for um, uh, animal support kind of service uh where if anyone sees uh, any animals on the street that are sick that are need help you would finance their medical or pay for their medical expenses um you also did a few other things that i know about but i want to hear you say something because this is something i think they really need to know okay so i mean it's true so that you know when i do this i don't talk about it because i feel like it might just 
create the effect that I did it so people know about it. Right. So we did, I mean, you know it, so shall I? I know, I, mean, I know it, for, but for you know, <laughs> it's... I don't know. I invest, I mean, to keep it general, I invest uh, into a lot of medical research. And right. uh, also, which basically uh, is close to my heart, but also while I do that, it helped a lot of other people, I believe. Um, we... We don't only do this here in the Middle East. It actually happens in, in countries where they really need it. And but generally speaking, I mean, if you if you know, you know. If you don't know, just That's, I mean, I what if I give you examples? I mean, you know. The no, maybe. I I know. I look if if you don't mind me, can I mention a sure, few? Sure, sure. Um, I know you did build a school, um, in Ghana. If I'm not mistaken, with friends, yes, yeah, that was um, done with uh, you and a bunch of friends, and you did so many things. You do stuff in Europe where you just, you know, um, take a family that needs help and support. I I remember hearing this from one of our mutual friends who was with you there, and he told me that you know there was a family that really needed help, didn't have a father in the um, in the image, and you basically took them for a day where they the little girl and her mother could get anything they wanted okay so basically she is a young girl she was uh, sent home to die because she she has cancer oh my god and she's 16 so basically when i heard about this i said you don't have to die so i asked her what her wishes were and she said she wants to meet uh, at least the celebrity once in her life and she wants to see. And I said, look, don't worry about the celebrity. Done. But it's more important that I have a hope for you. And we have invested uh, into a company which actually cures cancer. Yes. So, so that that was something I really wanted to tell her. And I took her medical file. And, and yeah. So basically, this is a crazy topic that you also never spoke about. Um, but I did see it on... Uh, German newspaper where you have invested in a company that cures cancer alongside many other diseases um, but you've never mentioned this can you give us some more, more details on that yeah I mean look it comes from somewhere else so my sister has a, a so-called uncurable disease right she that's um, a random mutation in a DNA sequence which basically uh, leads to a certain severe type of epilepsy. So when I was eight years old, I, I heard that, or I saw that for the first time when she was born. Uh, I actually discovered her in the kitchen where she was blue in her face because she was kind of having a seizure. So back then, oh. that was the reason why I decided, okay, I have to solve this issue. As a child, you obviously think about taking her to a doctor. But when the doctors said, I don't, this is kind of not curable. I said, well, then I give you money and you cure it. That's how I thought about it as a child. I said, just earn so much money that you can buy everybody to work for it. And that's basically why I started to think about becoming a professional football player, becoming a rich doctor. This is actually the reason. So the, the real reason to why Saigon wanted <coughs> to be a millionaire or billionaire was because you wanted to help cure your... <coughs> sister yes or find because a the point was that i thought that would help right and today basically this is um now actually it took me 22 years to actually uh, realize that this is actually true you can do that when i was 29 pretty much so 22 8 plus 22 it was 29 um i had won an award here in dubai as the I think digital business of the year, and that award ceremony, right? Um, my sister was at home here visiting me, and then she had a seizure, and I called. I got a call from my mother, and she said, "You have to come back home." While you were at the awards, so it was the best and worst day at the oh same time. Oh my god! So I basically went there. I saw that. I said, "Hey, we have to solve it." So, so then I figured, okay. What does she have? I didn't really know what it was. And honestly speaking, the doctors didn't know either. So I did the same thing I did when I was a DJ, when I was uh, 
um, aspiring aesthetic plastic surgeon, I figured who's the authority in this industry. Same concept. I looked at it from an entrepreneurial point of view. Right. I said, how do you know who's the best? So again, I went to the universities. I went to the, best, to the best ones actually worldwide and they all ignored me pretty much. They said, we bring her here and cost like a hundred thousand dollars to just do a meeting whatever and all these things and i figured okay there must be different ways of getting in and then uh, long story short i figured out that there was a certain uh, certain disease which uh, is caused by random mutation in the dna sequence which basically i sent back to the german doctors i said can you test it for this and they pretty much said how likely would it be? That's like finding a needle in a haystack. I said, please test oh it. My God. And the test alone, I don't know, was like $10,000. I said, fine, go ahead, test it. And then after 22 years of her having this, I found out what she had. You finally found out. And then I met the best, I met actually the person uh, who uh, discovered this disease. I went to her 80th birthday and I said, now I know which fight I'm fighting. I didn't even know which war I was in. And then I know from that point of view, she's now seizure free. She has uh, the right medication. So she has no side effects or very little side effects. And that was because I just didn't accept failure. And that is crazy because you went, I'm sure, to hundreds of different doctors and in the beginning it was a big struggle trying to even just understand what's going on right yes. and um once you figure out like it was a two-year journey for you yes to even get to the point of understanding what's going on with your sister and at that point where you did you ever think that you were did you ever feel like you were going to give up? No, I still don't because I had three goals. The first one, seizure freedom. The second one was minimization of side effects. And the third one was um, um, her cognitive skills. Okay. Re re regeneration of her cognitive skills, which is uh, the toughest, right? So because it, it comes with a learning disability. So basically to reverse that or to her allow to learn again, is the toughest one and this is what we're still working on and this also has a link to the cancer research which uh, i'm involved with as but a minimal small part i'm not a scientist but i actually got to know the best ones in the world and uh, when you say um the learning process for her to learn again um is that something actually that is possible like do you did where have you reached with that like what do you think in terms of I, the research you've I done. believe that there is a cure for every disease. I just also believe that we have to be diligent enough to, to find out. And it, it, it requires investment. So that's how I look at it. From an entrepreneurial point of view, I just say if you put the best people around uh, this subject on one table, then they'll find a solution. And even if they don't find that solution, they might find a different solution for other people. And uh, this is this is pretty much what I'm working for. Did you now with the research you've done for your sister, is this able? Are you able to help others with this? Like, does this apply? I'm sure there's someone else who had the same issue and doesn't have that financial, and that probably will that you had, right? So during my journey of finding help for her, I actually. Uh, got to know people who who saw, I would say, if I wasn't selfish, I would say even bigger problems like cancer. Oh, wow. Uh, and I have seen it. I, um, I've sat with the CEO one-on-one -on -one for an hour. He showed me a picture of a woman who was sent home to die, 36 kilos. And, oh, my God. And then he cured her. And she's 72 kilos now. She still lives. And he has proven it many times, and it just waits for FDA approval. It takes time. He told me it takes 500,000 pages of documentation to approve one new medication to just get FDA approval. That's, That's just U.S. So, so this guy... It takes years, pretty much. But he has, has the cure for cancer. 
Yes, for several types of eight types of cancer, and that's just one of the things. And I mean, and he has no enough funding. He has company. no he has he has no enough funding over a billion dollars in funding. So, but it, uh, it took him, I think it's the ninth year now. That's incredible. You being invested in a company that cures cancer, can has the cure for cancer for several types. Yes, colon cancer. Lung cancer and six others, and that's just one. He has, I have seen it. Uh, the first drug which coming is coming out is for osteoarthritis, which okay. is uh, actually uh, a, every person above forty years needs that. Wow! At one point of time, it's first of all a huge business, right? That's, however how the company does not look at it if you look at it actually what the team has done they have donated nine they have pledged 98.9 percent of their shares to charity they said whatever they get out of it wow god will give them that is incredible that is yeah so these are really i admire these people and like you said without the finance aspect without the you wouldn't be able to achieve these things, right? No, I wouldn't get access to it. Plain and simple. And do you feel like that is... I think it's a means to an end. I mean, we can always say money is not important until you get a $100,000 bill or a million dollar bill from your doctors and you'll see how important it is. Right. That's very true. Um, So... Your sister being your inspiration in general, um, is there anything else that inspires you, that you drives you? Um, is there something that you look at and say, you know, uh, that's where I want to be or that's who I w- would like to be like? I mean, I love, I love building companies. I love seeing these small babies become big or die. Right. I mean, they are just <laughs> they're just companies. They're not yeah. humans, but so it happens. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's a great feeling to see companies grow and uh, building teams. This is what kind of wakes me up, also. Uh, your family doesn't live with you in Dubai, right? Um, is that hard for you? Yes, I think that's one of the uh, the sacrifices. Well, probably the biggest sacrifice I I make is just they will live in Germany and I live here. But I do travel a lot and I obviously invite them as much as possible. And is there a reason? Is it just... Um... It's tough for my mother and father to, to you know, move to a new country. They, they're just a different generation. I think they, have they their, moved once and that's it. They have their habits. They're used to they have a their certain circle. lifestyle. Yes. My grandparents are there. And uh, so I think it's just... To take them out of that network would be too selfish for me as well. You're going to be flying to Haiti soon with Jason Derulo and Sean Penn uh, for a charity organization that you guys have invested in as well. Yes, um, yes, I'm looking forward to it. And what is that exactly? We were actually planning to go there uh, already, but there were riots going on so it was not safe to go but we're definitely going to go there jason has a foundation which i'm uh uh, one of the investors which basically you're the second largest individual (laughs) donator (laughs) i'm just gonna put that out there (laughs) so basically he is uh he's built a school and he's helping and sean penn has been helping before i mean there's a lot of uh, footage of him actually helping the earthquake victims which we forgot about because it's been eight, nine years, but They're people still are suffering. still suffering. Yes, the country is really uh, poor. And um, so Jason's roots are from there, so I was happy to help. But again, you will not find it on my social media. <laughs> That's true. Um, do you find, uh, did you ever hear, by the way, Sean Penn, did you know the thing with El Chapo? Have you ever 
I heard I, that story. I read it. I read it in the news. <laughs> yeah, it's a. <laughs> what I think, do you think uh, about that? I don't know that much. I just heard that he got arrested after he met him. There's so, a lot of uh, stories about that. The only chap I, I would, know. I is, would. <laughs> I would want to ask him. I would. <laughs> Champagne, if you hear that. I'll ask him. I'll ask him. <laughs> yeah, come on the show. <laughs> but my 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 chapel, the only one I know, oh. is, is my little cat. <laughs> so Saigon has two cats, right? Um, Pablo and El Chapo. Chapo Why? Not El oh, Chapo. Okay, Chapo. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you name them these after gangster mobs? I, 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 <laughs> I don't know. Guys. So no, it has nothing to do with them. So no. <laughs> Chapo means shorty. Okay. And he is the smaller one. And Pablo is just because the guy uh, I could, <laughs> not the guy as a human, but the guy cat, he just looks like a Pablo. So I call him Pablo. Okay. <laughs> I like that. I like that. It's coincidence. <laughs> um how many languages do you speak? I think you speak German, like this of what I know. German, Turkish, um, English, uh Spanish, since you said you went to Spain course and but you know i went to mexico i also stayed a, a month in madrid and went to language school there as well but you know because i don't have a lot of spanish friends here i kind of you know they say languages are like cats yeah they if you don't if you don't treat them well they just forget about you they don't care about you so they disappear <laughs> <laughs> so i need well, to kind of nourish them well why don't you try it right now what tell t give me like a sentence okay, on est, each estudiado en mexico estudiado. Pero, no, pero no tengo amigos aquí oh, entonces nice. no puedo hablar fluidísimo <laughs> what did that <laughs> what was that what did you just i just say? said uh, you know i studied in mexico okay but uh, because I don't have a lot of friends here, uh, Spanish friends here, so that's oh. why I don't speak it fluently anymore. But it give me like if I if I stayed there a month, I think I could come back into it somehow. But yeah, yeah. give me a little in Turkish. Nesolim. What's that? Ana dil Turkçe. I just said, what should I say? Uh, my mother tongue is Turkish. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ich kann auch Deutsch reden. Also yeah, Deutsch. Auch. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for the people who don't know, I was born and raised in Germany too. So me and Saigen, generally, we only talk in German. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Deutsch ist uh, auch eine Muttersprache, ne? Yeah, because, I mean, I was, you know, born and raised there. So for you, of, that that was easy to... Yeah, I think that's, that's easy now. But in the first three years of my life, I didn't speak German because my mother said, you'll learn it anyway. So she taught me Turkish because I never lived in Turkey. So, okay. So it was important for me to actually grow up uh, learning Turkish and German. What about Arabic? Ten years yeah, in Dubai. Yeah. Don't yeah, disappoint yeah. me, Sai. <laughs> Give me a <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Kelam Arabi, but you know, shway. Shway, shway. Yeah, But oh. the problem is, the problem is that the, I went to I went to school here. Okay. Uh, to language school for two years, and I learned it. The issue is in Dubai, no one speaks Arabic with you. Yeah. But, uh, you, like, I mean, it depends on your circle, right? Yeah. Like, no, but the Arabic the Arabic people they speak English would be because they feel like. You know, it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't want to go through that hassle. <laughs> like, you know, slowly, slowly though. So, but, but generally speaking, I think um, we have a Turkish saying which says one language is one person. Uh, so if you speak uh, four five, different, yeah, you're, four or five, then you're like five persons. Yeah, you're wiser. I think languages make you wiser. Yeah. Um, what would you give... Give us some business advice. What would you advise young guys, young audience that are listening? How does one become, have a success story like yours? Huh, in a nutshell. So it yeah. doesn't have to be like mine. I think success... You and I want to guarantee on that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you sign here after yeah, you finish? <laughs> come to my show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need that, bro. <laughs> I think, first of all, it's important to define... Uh, success what is success for you you know now you know what my driver is which basically keeps me going the whole time it should be some vision you have which is so big for you that or so important for you that it it creates this passion inside you right true 
So if you just do it for the money, you will just um, not be successful. I right. think money is just a means to an end. It's not a target. It's definitely not. What are you going to do with the money? Or what are you, whatever that is, right? So once you know that, so once you, you know. Um, and the money comes naturally, right? That's the thing that a lot of people forget that with growth, Money if if comes you in. if no it doesn't have to like the point is money comes with uh, a successful business or something but sometimes you don't really define that as a means to end you have other things people some people don't even need money to reach, achieve their goals having said that um, I think if you're a captain of a ship uh, and you don't know where you're going you will never arrive right so, right so you basically need to know where you're going and then uh any uh, any effort you have points to that direction then uh, you you'll be successful now obviously it's not just mindset as i said right mindset is just one part of it and then it's it's a craft business is not just mindset it's a craft you have to learn the basics of business you have to learn uh, how do you uh, identify business ideas how do you evaluate them how do you build right. a business plan how do you build a team how do you raise funds for your business and how do you actually have operational excellence with business intelligence? So these are the things I'm actually talking about uh, during the tour. How important do you th think education plays a role in all of this? That's actually, uh, as I said, very important. Now, education does not equal going to uni, right? Or right. going to college. You can teach yourself. Right? At the end of the day, if you, if you uh, have mentors around you who can teach you that, or if you educate yourself online, you have to know those things. It, it's not that you can build a successful business without knowing the basics of business. You will probably outsource it to someone in your company who does know that, or, but then at the end of the day, that person knows it. So what is your value add? So having said that, um, education is super important. Now, what uni actually were, uh, brought to me was a network of driven people. I had a lot of people around me which had a, a similar mindset who were driven and they motivated me and they're still part of my circle. I think that's what I gained out of university beyond the basics of or even advanced uh, methods of business. That's amazing. You were a uh, much heavier Saigon Yalchen. Uh, <laughs> how long ago would we say? Almost a couple, I don't know, a year and a half? Two, a year and a half, two. right? <laughs> um you were quite like what 17 17 kilos more yeah oh i look different God. I 17 look different. kilos more um how did you what was the inspiration behind that <laughs> so what drove you th for that you know around two and a half years ago i went to to a doctor because i i lost hair right and i okay. had big patches of hair it wasn't like the regular hair loss you get with age or whatever, right? Okay. It was like a, just a patch, a bush of hair just disappearing from my, and there was just a hole. And I said, okay, so let me go to the doctor. And the doctor said, um, take this device, put it on your head, and sleep three nights with it. It will analyze your sleep. So I took it home and then uh, I put it on and after three days I gave, gave it back to him and he analyzed it and he came back to the room. He said, you didn't use this. I said, of course I used it. He said, well, you don't sleep. And and the, it showed that 97% of the time I think I'm sleeping, I'm actually in awake. I only reach REM one or two in three percent of the time. I'm actually lying down. Oh my god! So my body was totally exhausted. I was pretty much almost getting to burnout. And he said, "You'll die if you continue like this. You'll just at one point of time die of it by the age of probably less than forty. So he said, "What well, you need to work out. You need to do sports. You need to do med meditation, yoga, whatever. But relax and stop working the whole yeah. time." Because even your when your brain I, never shut off, I started basically focusing on sports. I also said I'm gonna set the goal. I'm gonna be on the cover of a magazine, and I'm gonna um, do this. And I did a hundred days straight every day. I posted it even on social media just to you know embarrass myself if I wouldn't have done it. Right. So it kept me going, and then now I I never stop. I obviously don't do every day. I just uh, do regularly, and I change my diet completely. And uh, it makes you it makes you actually more productive and happy. 
you also received an award for losing weight. I mean, there's only <laughs> a few no. people that receive an award for losing weight. Saigon is one of them. He received <laughs> an award from Men's Health. Uh, yes. For what was the award? Star of the Year 2018. Oh. Yes. That reminds me of school days. <laughs> star of the year. Star <laughs> of the class. <laughs> but that that must have felt good, right? Yes, it was uh, it was a nice gesture to to kind of award the things I I have been posting <laughs> online, but I think yeah. the biggest award was just, you know, my body change. Yes, up. Yeah. Um are you in a relationship? Of course. And okay. many. Yes. <laughs> what type of relationship you talking oh, about? Oh, we're talking about uh do you have a female companion yes, in your life? Yes, of course. I'm married. Yeah? Yes. That's amazing. Well, Saigon, I want you to tell me five things, okay? Yes. Five things you would have changed in your life or done different. Regrets? I don't have regrets. Not regrets, but If would I have done different. Okay. Well, It so can be anything. I played the lottery once and I chose the wrong numbers. I should have chosen. Right <laughs> <laughs> that, okay. That's one. <laughs> <laughs> That counts. <laughs> okay. Another one, maybe I should have focused more on sports before, uh, a little bit more, because it, it was just an excuse in terms of not having time for it. You just make right. time for it. Um, I should spend more time with my family. Okay. Uh, I want to change that and I uh, should change it before. Uh, isn't that enough? <laughs> I mean, okay. I, I'm sure you can give us another two. There's a there's some companies I never should have started because we lost a lot of money. You ne again, you never hear about the failures. You only Right. Hear and how, how that's part of the journey, right? Of course. You know, you need that. If you don't have failures, that just means you're not trying enough. No one just does a hundred things and all hundreds are successful. Our heads. No. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't work. So, and the last one, I think, uh, I don't know. Maybe I should have thought about regrets. <laughs> 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 I don't know. So I was more prepared for the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you love domains as well, right? Because I know you own crazy amount of hundred, domains. Hundreds, yeah. What? What made you get into that? Was it just the online business and you were like, you know what, maybe yeah. if I... I mean, it's just, you don't have to have so many domains. I just like them because they're nice. These are like addresses online, right? These are like, right. these are like you know, real estate online. And <laughs> when you say... Land. <laughs> land. <laughs> real, land online. <laughs> yes. Uh, when you say like, if you think of a business idea, do you have like a, a domain, a website for every idea or how does it work like do you no, just go through your catalog and be like here's the domain uh, no 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 that's not uh, <laughs> first of all you have to naming is a is a is a is an art as well and a skill right. set so you can't just name a company the way you want you have to check worldwide databases for trademarks and all right. these things you can't just call it uh, apple yeah right and do tech you can, yeah Uh, so so basically you you have to check that then you go and see some names for example i'm i'm a fan of short names you can pr you can spell even if you hear it in the radio okay and they're generic enough so for example they don't really limit you in the industry okay so don't you sell any car <laughs> <laughs> I think there was attempts of uh, <laughs> Do you find a lot of attempts of people trying to copy your concepts and ideas and names? So I'm a I'm a fan of uh, people doing the same business of me I'm doing. That's fine. Then you you know that's just a compliment and people should do this because if I build a company which I cannot uh, protect if if they do, if i don't have market power then at one point of time the better one should win right i'm so i'm f i'm all for competition what i'm not for is people uh doing trademark infringement so that's uh, that's okay. happened a lot so confusing people confusing consumers into believing that that company is me right, right? so i don't know for example sell any car is mine and someone comes up and says we sell any car <laughs> 
Yeah. Right? That's too confusing. So people might think, oh, I trust Zygon, I trust Selene Car, so I go there. And then suddenly you figure out, oh, that was just a, a confusion. That's called trademark infringement. And we right. have been uh, in, t- in many court cases where we always have won and taken over these. And okay. uh, that's just not professional. But being Anything, competitive yeah. competition is fine. That's fine. Um, well, I'm opening uh, a company that's called we happy bugs. <laughs> we happy bugs <laughs> and uh, we sell chocolates and stuff but i, I mean com- competition is healthy bro i'm just saying yes, that is. <laughs> by the way one more question um how do you feel about materialistic things um because you don't wear brands from head to toe that's not Saigon, you actually wear a very simple <laughs> uh, wardrobe. You generally, that's all you wear. Um, I don't categorically uh, uh, deny wearing brands. I just don't focus on it or need to. Like, I don't know, this T-shirt maybe costs $10, so right. it's good enough. But if I buy a T-shirt for $800, then I will. It's just, it's not really something I have to symbolize or signal something to and I think black and white always is nice. Or just always black. works, yeah, right? Just black. <laughs> Simple. Are you? Do you collect sneakers? Are you like no, one no, of no. these? Uh, I no. don't collect sneakers. Uh, Shoes? No, no, I don't. You don't have. To I don't collect that. anything. You you don't collect anything. Anything like uh, clothing? I mean, I don't collect. Like, uh, what about? Do you have, collect anything else? Like CDs or? Uh, you collect games uh yes i love collect- old school i oh that's a lot i have like the nintendo nes the n64 like the old atari sega yeah. mega drive that i collect i never play them <laughs> yeah i just have them but they them. are functional though right? yeah, yeah you they, they them have to, to. <laughs> they have to work <laughs> prove that to me he's like bro but this works i'm like yeah but this is like 1990 i don't want to <laughs> use this thing he's like no but it works look i'm like okay <laughs> So again, <laughs> that's crazy though you yeah. love those things <laughs> yes 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 that's awesome thank you so much for being on the show thank you for um having me. you're welcome anytime let us know if you have anything new um you're always coming up with new stuff so and there's still a lot i'm sure we haven't covered True. you know i'm gonna look back at this and be like Oh, I should have asked Saigon this. <laughs> but it's not going to be his last time part on two. the show. Part yeah, two. Yeah, there's going to be a part two uh, <laughs> of more questions from the audience. Then. That is nice. Nice. Yeah? I like it. I obviously follow you online. But for all those people that want to follow you, they can follow you on Instagram, YouTube, Saigon Yalchen. Um, and that's spelled Y-A-L-C-I-N. Yeah, S-A-Y-G-I-N. Y A L C I N. Are you subscribed? Of course I am. All right. And if they're not subscribed, what do they do? Then they subscribe at my channel. <laughs> 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 subscribe to Saigon Yachin, guys. <laughs> and subscribe here. Like and comment. If you're listening to the audio version, please tune in and check out the visuals because they are cool. And he's wearing a white t shirt. Yes. If and you want to see that, black pants. Go online. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Cheers.